Okay, the objective of this third chapter, which is titled Data Representation, is to distinguish between analog and digital information. Also, to be able to explain how data compression works and what exactly is a compression ratio. We will also explain how binary formats are used to represent negatives and floating point values. Those are the, uh, uh, the most common values that are being represented in a computer. Later on in another video lecture, we're going to be able to describe the characteristics of the ASCII and the Unicode character sets. So how are the characters represented in a computer? We're also going to do several types of text compression. We're going to explain the nature of sound and how it's represented in a computer. We're also going to explain what the red, group, red, green, and blue values define or how they define a color. We're also going to be able to distinguish between the raster and the vector graphics. And finally, we're going to be able to explain the temporal and spatial video compression. How is video represented in a computer and how it's being compressed. So that's a lot to cover. So let's start with the first section, which is about numbers. So computers are pretty much multimedia devices. So they're being used to represent numbers, texts, audio, images, and graphics, and video. What exactly is data compression? Data compression is the reduction of the amount of space needed to store a piece of data. And that piece of data, regardless, it could be numbers, graphics, videos, audio, it doesn't matter. If you reduce the amount of space that it needed to store that piece of data, then you are actually compressing it. Now, what is a compression ratio? Compression ratio is the size of the compressed data divided by the size of the original data. That's how when you say, oh, my compression ratio is 50%, that means that you were able to reduce the size of your data to half the amount of memory needed to store it. Now, Data compressions could, uh, there, there are two different types of techniques. There's one is called the lossless and the other one is the lossy. Lossless, which are the most commonly used ones, are the ones that allow the data to be compressed without losing any data from the original uh, data. And lossy is the one which will allow a little bit of loss of the original data, but it will still be useful. <clears throat> so information in a computer can be stored in one of two ways. It could be stored as analog or digital. Well, not in a computer, but information in general can be stored in, in either analog or digital. Now. Analog, analog data is a continuous representation. It's also called analogous to the actual information it represents. Digital data, on the other hand, is a discrete representation, which basically it's not continuous. It just breaks it up into little chunks of information, into, into little separate elements, and then try to represent each individual segment separately with a digit. So to give you an example, a thermometer is an, an analog device. Why? Because in a mercury thermometer, the, the, uh, the mercury continually rises in, direction, in direct proportion to the temperature at which it's, it's um, measuring. So that's a continuous analog way of representing the temperature. Now, if we were to do it in a digital way, we will have to transform that level of mercury into 
fractions or segments that would allow us to represent the numbers, the equivalent numbers in a digital way. That's how computers work. Unfortunately, computers cannot work well with analog data and therefore they must digitize the data. So to digitize again is breaking the data into pieces and representing those pieces separately as digits. Now, since computers store data in a binary system, and we already covered that in the previous chapter, then the best way for the computer to actually represent that digital, uh, digitized data is to use the binary system. That's why we use the binary system to represent digitized data. Now let's cover a little bit about electronic signals because that's this is when it's going to allow us to uh, understand why computers work wor work better with um, digits. So. These are a few important facts about electronic signals. An analog signal continually fluctuates voltage up and down because it's it's analog. So if you can imagine a, an analog signal being a bunch of curves measuring whatever it's measuring, but it's representing some kind of data. It could be temperature, it could be whatever, pressure. And a digital signal has only a high or low state so there's nothing that fluctuates smoothly and those high and low states correspond to two binary digits either a one or a zero so the equivalent will be something like this in which we have zero at the bottom then you have a sharp climb to a one and then a sharp uh, um, descending to the zero. So this will represent a one and this will represent a zero. Now all electronic signal signals, whether they're analog or digital, it doesn't matter, they degrade as they move down a line as they're being transmitted, they degrade. Now the voltage of the signal fluctuates due to the environmental effects. So it's possible that the voltage could fluctuate within a certain range due to the environment. So what does that do to the signals? That means that the signals gradually um, they, uh, they gradually um, degrade and therefore um, a digital signal is reclocked to regain its original shape. That causes that digital signals, which only represent, do not represent any analog or curves, and only represent digits, a one or a zero, two states. That means that with a reclocking, they can keep the original data intact. While with analog systems, the degradation makes the system lose the original information, the original data. Now, how do we represent <coughs> binary? Um, as we all know, in the binary system, one bit can represent zero or one. So one bit can represent two things, right? Zero being off or down or whatever, and one being on or up. So it can really represent two things, just one bit, because it has two states, a zero and a one. Now, two bits can represent four things because it will be a combination of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. So it's the on-off state combined together of two different bits. And if we continue going through samples of how many things can be represented in the number of bits, you can see that there's a formula that how many things can be represented in three bits? Two to the third. In four, two to the four. And in five bits, or in eight bits, two to the eighth. So given that, 
we can actually see how all the different bits have all the different values. And that's how we count, or that's how computers count using the binary system. <clears throat> so as we know, the number of things that can n bits represent will be 2 to the n. So what happens every time that you increase the number of bits by 1? That means you're actually doubling the number of things you can represent. So that's fine as long as we are only representing positive numbers. However, with negative numbers, we've got to come up with a special methodology in order for the computer to represent them. Because we're going to have to use the same bits, zeros and ones, to represent negative numbers as well. So there's something called the sign magnitude number representation. And the sign represents the ordering, obviously. Positive means it's to the right of the zero in the, um, in the axis, in the x-axis. And the digits to the left of the zero are the negative numbers. So the sign represents the ordering of the numbers, and the digits represent the magnitude of the number. Now, there is a problem with the sign magnitude representation. And I hope you can guess why. Because in a computer, there is a possibility that if you represent a number, a positive number, starting with 0, you will come up with the 0 positive. And if you represent a whole different set of numbers, just all negatives with the same binary system, then you're going to come up with the minus 0. And that causes a lot of complexity when you have two number systems that have a, uh, a different values for the same representation, or two different representations for the same value, which is in this case 0. A plus 0 and a minus 0 are the same thing. It's just 0. So the solution to this um, Rep uh, rep representation problem is to keep all numbers as integers. We're just going to keep them all as integers, but then we're going to use half of them to represent the negative numbers. So how can we do that? Well, using two decimal digits, for instance, let 1 through 49 be the positive numbers. So they represent uh, 0 represents the 0, 1 represents the 1, 2 represents the 2, etc., all the way to 49. And then let the 50 through 99, which is the rest of the two digits, uh, uh, of the two decimal digits, represent the negative numbers. So 50 will represent minus 50, and all the way to 99, which will represent a minus 1. So if you can visualize this, we will start with 0, 1, all the way to 49, and as soon as you hit the next number, 50, you automatically representing a minus 50, all the way to 99, in which you're representing a minus 1. So given this, that means that to perform an addition, you can add the numbers and discard any carryover. So it's very simple. Suppose that you want to add 5 and minus 6. 5 is 5 because it's positive. But minus 6 in the new system, minus 6 will be equivalent to 94 somewhere in this scale. So if you add 5 and 94, that will give you 99. in the new scheme. Okay, so 99, if we go to the scale, notice that it's a minus 1, and that is the correct answer to 5 minus 6. 5 minus 6 is actually minus 1. And you can keep doing other examples of it. 
if you end up with carrying over you just uh, ignore the rest of the digits in the carryover <coughs> so how do we do subtraction then well subtraction remember is actually in addition of the negative of the number so a minus b is equivalent to a plus minus b so in a subtraction you basically add the negative of the second number to the first number so in this case minus 5 minus 3 is the same thing as minus 5 in the new scheme it will be 95 minus 3 minus 3 in the new scheme is 97 and then you add the numbers 95 and 97 that gives you 92 you discard the carryover 92 if you go into the uh, in the, to the new scheme it's equivalent to minus 8 so indeed minus 5 minus 3 is minus 8 <clears throat> so here's the formula to compute the negative representation of a number in the decimal system for instance the negative of the number i is equal to 10 to the k where k is the number of digits that you want to represent it in minus i <coughs> and this representation is called the tens complement so if we were to represent in a two digit system the number minus 5 according to the formula it will be 10 to the 2 because we want it in a two digit system that's 10 square which is 100 minus minus 5 which is plus 5 so it will be 105 okay and then in the new system 105 will be equi equivalent to just discard the carryover of the 1 in the 100 then it will be 0, 5 which is 5 so the negative of minus 5 is 5 and that is correct and this is called a representation uh, in, in this representation is called the tens complement and there's something equivalent to the tens complement called the twos complement and the idea is it will also have the same formula it will be the negative of a number will be equal to 2 to the k where k is the number of digits minus the number and so what that allows us is to represent negative values using a binary system and this is the system that the computers use to represent negative values basically if the first digit is a 1 then it's a negative number if it's a 0 then it's a positive number and then the rest of the digits would represent the actual value whether it's positive 0 through 127 in 7 digits uh, in 7 bits and then from minus 128 to minus 1 using the rest of the bits now how is addition and subtraction the same as in the 10 complements arithmetic well if you say for instance I want to be able to add minus 127 plus 1 minus 127 as we know in the new schema binary schema will be to 1 0 0 0 0 0 1 and here we have it and 1 will be this one if you add them up it will come up with this number 1 plus 1 0 carry over that's a 1 and the rest stay the same because you're adding zeros to it and this number is equivalent to minus 126 so as you can notice the 1 indicates the leftmost bit if it's a 1 indicates it's a negative number if it's a 0 indicates it's a positive number 
Now, what happens is the computed value won't fit in those eight bits that we're trying to accommodate. That's what it's called, typically called an overflow. So if each value is stored using 8 bits, adding 3 to, for instance, 127 will overflow it. So this is the equivalent of 127. Let's take a look at the binary system again. So 0 plus 7 once is 127. And here it is. Sorry. Here it is. Two, four, six, seven, seven ones. And then you add three, which is one, one, and the rest zeros. When you add them, one plus one, zero, you carry over one. One plus one, zero, and the one you carry, that's one. <coughs> then you carry one. One plus one is zero, and then you carry one. And then you keep doing that until you hit the one carry and this is actually representing a negative number so in reality if this is trying to represent a positive number then we will overflow but it could also represent a negative number which in this case it will be incorrect because we're trying to add actually 127 plus 3 which is we know it's 130 this is 130 but in the new schema, that number will be minus 126. So problems occur when, map when mapping an infinite world onto a finite machine.